All right. So let us start. We today. So today we are going to address the following questions. So the first question is basically uh, how can one construct a fundamental domain for a discrete group of isometries? And the second question is uh, how these fundamental domains look like? Uh, in fact, these questions are um, closely related to each other. So I will write down them here. So the first question how can we construct a fundamental domain for a discrete group gamma? And how do the fundamental domains look like? In fact, they are not uniquely determined as we discuss. So how do fundamental domains look like? And actually, the answer to kind of like both questions simultaneously, we can construct them in such a way that fundamental domains are convex polyhedra. And generally, they are the so-called generalized convex polyhedra. So I will write down the answer here. But this is the goal of our lecture today. So the answer for both questions simultaneously we can construct fundamental domains as generalized convex polyhedron. And moreover, sometimes these convex polyhedra have actually very nice geometric and combinatorial properties, but we will see it later. Uh, we discuss, so we already started discussing this for reflection groups. So the plan for right now is just to delve more into reflection groups a bit more. We, can, we will consider the modular group PSL to Z, uh, and then we will really move to the broader setting of discrete groups of isometries. Okay, so recall that the reflection group is the so recall that a reflection group is a discrete group generated by reflections in hyperplanes. We so we showed that a fundamental domain fundamental domain for a reflection group gamma. can be obtained as a connected component
of the following set. So I'm taking all mirrors of reflections. I take the union of all those reflections and remove them from my space, right? So here, where H alpha are all hyperplanes, all invariant hyperplanes. Okay, all. I would say actually fixed hyperplanes, right? Fixed hyperplanes of reflections are alpha sitting in my group gamma. An important note is that the set of so sometimes these are called walls if these belong to the polyhedra or these are called mirrors of reflections, right? So these fixed hyperplanes are sometimes called mirrors. Okay, so the like, a more or less simple fact is that this set is Gamma invariant. Yeah, so I'm leaving this as a note. The set of all H alpha, right? Okay, H alpha is a fixed point set of R alpha for all R alpha in gamma. is invariant, is gamma invariant. For a reflection group gamma. So this implies in particular that connected components uh, are permuted by the gamma action, right? So thus, connected components of x minus the union of all alpha h alpha are permuted by gamma action. So from this one can already, from this construction, we basically see that the, every connected component is just something bounded by hyperplanes, right? So let me write down this concentration. So from the buff, we see that our, so we pick our connected component, right? So we see that a connected component, okay, any connected component P any connected component is bounded by some number of hyperplanes. <laughs> And this leads us to the following definition. A convex polyhedron in X is the set P, which is the intersection 
of some number okay a convex polyhedron will be in the intersection of a finite number of hyper uh, of half spaces so i will write it this way from by k from 1 to capital n h k minus where so with non empty interior with the interior of p being non empty and h okay to be more precise i want to say that h k minus means that actually there is so we can think of this uh, in the sense of vector model so this is h e k minus which is the set of vectors and this is a little bit tricky i will uh, write the here uh still x but let me specify this so the scalar product of x with ek is less than or equal less than or equal to zero but i want to leave some remark uh remark so for x being s n right so in fact i can i would use here like those angled brackets so uh for x x n and h n or s d or h d uh it is just is written here right so for x s d or h d uh okay uh this is a little bit not not a very good notation uh let me write here not belonging to x but belonging to the i don't know vector space associated to x um uh, So I will write something like that. So for x, this we have x either rd plus one or rd comma one, right? The Lorentzian space. And for x being the Euclidean space we have x r d but this inequality should be a little bit modified h e minus in general the half space so this is a half space this is my hyperplane h e right and then what is on the left so suppose that there is a vector e then everything which lies here is my h e minus right and then this is h e plus the scalar product of points with this vector here will be greater or equal than zero on this side this will be less than or equal than zero and the point is that in fact for the euclidean spaces we parameterize hyperplanes by two parameters we have the vector orthogonal to e and we have the number t since generally our hyperplanes are some linear functions plus some uh, free parameter t, right? So this is given by all x 
in Rd such that the scalar product of x and e plus t is less than or equal to zero. Okay, yeah, I hope it's, it's clear. Uh, so the picture of a chamber, right, the picture of a chamber is here I can just, so it is bounded by some number of hyperplanes, H1, H2. The point is that we have, we can assume that we have unit normal vectors, right? And that our area P is bounded by some number of hyperplanes, right? This is the picture. And this is expressed in this general definition. Okay, so the idea is that uh, in our classical spaces, we can use the vector model for hyperbolic space. This simply means that this is the hyperboloid model, right? Uh, but in fact, uh, this is well defined, so we can pass to other models, and you can see how it, um, how the convex polyhedra look like in other. Um, so let me try to give some examples of convex polyhedra, and then we will pass to discrete groups. Okay, so examples of convex polyhedra. Okay, so obviously in dimension, I don't know, dimension two, right, EG, where G is equal to two, I can just take the triangle with vertices zero, one, and here we also have one, right? This triangle is bounded by three lines, so it is, in fact, an intersection of L, I don't know, J minus, where J from one to three, this is my triangle, right? And here, L1, so let me assume that this is the first one, this is the second vector, and this is the third vector bounding this. So L1, and L3 do not have this, in fact, they do not have this parameter T that is equal to zero. So my, uh, okay, and X, right? X is now the point from R2, right? Which is my telegraphic. Okay, it's, it's more, it more looks like he, okay? So uh, L1 is given by what it is, the second coordinate, uh, is equal to a zero, right? So this inequality, so ln L1 minus basically is determined by the condition that x1 is uh, greater, sorry, s1 is greater uh, than zero, right? Greater or equal than zero. L2 gives me that, oh, sorry, actually, X2. Or, so this is my line L1, this is my line L2, and this is my line L3, okay? So here I have X1 greater or equal than zero, and here I have, so this line, is given by the equation x uh, one plus x two is probably equal to one, right? So what I obtain is that x one. Okay, so the vector. This is precisely the vector. One one with coordinates one one orthogonal to my line, right? So x one plus x two should be. Uh, greater or equal than one, right? 
Is it correct? No, no, less or equal to one. Yeah, thanks. It should be less than or equal to one. So in fact, my vectors here, this is my vector E1, right? This is my normal vector E2, and this is my vector E3. Uh, I, well, in fact, I do not need them to be normalized. It's just sometimes it's for convenience. Right here, I'm not going to normalize it since the vector 1, 1 will not have unit norm. Uh, so my vectors E1, my vector E1 here is with coordinates 0, minus 1, the vector E2 is with coordinates minus 1, 0, and the vector E3 is with coordinates 1, 1, right? So from this, we can see that thus Lj is actually H, J, uh, where, okay, it's H, J, zero, or J equals one and two, and L3 is the hyperplane determined by E3 and the number T from here is one, right? So this is this like uh yes it should be minus one correct it should be minus one thanks okay so you see we you can think of convex polyhedron in the plane as just something with vertices sides and so on but you can think of this as an intersection of half spaces this is very convenient uh, in the setting of reflection groups, and this is convenient in higher dimensions. So generally, you can generalize this to, you can think of cubes and tetrahedra in higher dimensional Euclidean spaces. So something like that. Okay, uh, I am interested in uh, hyperbolic. So, in the hyperbolic spaces, we view convex polyhedra as intersections. So this, in fact, means that there is an intersection so I, I take some polyhedral convex cone in RD1, right? And then I choose the points where this polyhedron intersects the hyperboloid. And this gives me the, this gives me some triangle in the intersection Okay, it, this is this is a triangle in this can concrete picture. So some I obtain something like that, right? But so say triangle triangles are intersections. of polyhedral cones in R uh, to one with the hyperboloid model, right? With H2. And this is for the case D is equal to two, right? There is a very famous, uh, so what is interesting that uh, convex polyhedra 
Uh, so one can like see, okay, so this definition with the half spaces with inequalities, it is like determined, is given specifically for the hyperboloid model of the hyperbolic space or for the vector model. But how can, uh, can we see it in uh, dimension, so in other models? So say we have uh, in other models, uh, one thinks just geometrically geometrically that every hyperplane. every hyperplane divides right it divides the space okay in other models of hd i will write it here of hd divides the space into two half spaces right H, okay, every hyperplane H and the half space is H minus and H plus. So for instance, in the upper half plane model, I can draw this triangle. This is an ideal triangle, right? And so the intuition is that I have H1, H2, H3 in this picture, right? And I, okay, I do not have, in fact, I can find some vectors even in this model. So for instance, there is a vector orthogonal to this vertical hyperplane, right? To this vertical half line. There is another vector orthogonal to this, and there is even a vector which is orthogonal to the sphere, like to the hemisphere orthogonal to the boundary. But it's already not that useful since, like uh, this, in a, uh, so the negative, uh, okay, the positive half space, which is outside of the triangle, it is not determined uh, really by this inequality, right? So it's specifically for the hyperboloid model where you have vectors, but still you have this division right into two half spaces and you can think of the intersection of finite number of half spaces. Uh, right, okay. So this is about examples in uh, the classical spaces like Euclidean or hyperbolic ones. Now the definition of the of a generalized polyhedron. I will write it here. A generalized convex polyhedron. is an intersection of possibly infinitely many half spaces H alpha minus. So where the set A is possibly where A may be infinite. Such that locally it looks like a standard convex polyhedron. It means that uh, such that for every ball, such that every ball in X, every ball in X, can intersect only 
can intersect only a finite number of bounding hyperplanes H alpha, right? A finite number of bounding hyperplanes H alpha. This is the definition of a generalized convex clahedron. Let me highlight it. And the picture of a generalized convex polyhedron can be provided even uh, in, the, in, the, in the Euclidean plane. We can do something like that okay let me i guess let me move to the another board probably this one Another example of a so uh, it is a, an example of a generalized convex polyhedron. We take the Euclidean plane E2, and so let it be. That's my axis. I don't know. I, I will not denote the axis, uh, and I'm doing something like that. I can change an angle all the time such that it gives me an infinite. So basically you can choose the vertices to be just in, in integers, right? One minus one, two, sorry, minus two, two and so on, right? Hope you understand the idea. You just pick uh, the coordinate corresponding to the axis y, just like very small, uh, such that the sum of uh, okay, the sum of differences it should be convergent, and then it allows you to to have yeah, an infinite, an inf infinitely sided polyhedron. Infinity slide is polygon. Sided polygon convex. Generalized convex polygon, right? And this is indeed, uh, ob well, it is like obvious if you choose right, the vertices sitting in integers, right? It's obvious it is indeed locally finite. So this condition uh, that was, I need to show it again on the right board, right? So this condition about the ball intersecting only a finite number of bounding hyperplanes, it is just the condition of locally finiteness. This means that we cannot have accumulation points of uh, vertices or sides or edges of our poly polyhedra. Uh, so coming back to this board with example, you can just notice that every ball will intersect only some finite number because it will cover only some finite number of integer edges, uh, sorry, integer of the vertices with the first integer coordinate. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, an example in H2 uh, 
uh, can also be provided. Let me think about something in H2. So let me try to use the upper half plane model zero one minus one. So what do you think about this? Is will is this going to be an ideal? Right? Does it work? Yeah. So in the uh disk model it is going to look I don't know, it's going to look like that. But uh, you can think of this as, so basically you will not, uh, yeah, it's it, okay, it's complicated to draw it here, but this is my convex polygon, right? Generalized convex polygon. Okay. Uh, now, yeah, so the point is that you will have this. So it is not a finite number of, uh, so that's why it's hard to draw it here. Uh, you can uh, draw this some number of uh, circles are flowing to the boundary and uh, imagine that they kind of like have accumulation points so uh so that they are getting smaller and smaller converging to some infinite point which is basically the image of the infinity from the upper half plane here okay that's that's an idea so in fact there is a theorem that uh any discrete group of isometries has a fundamental domain which is a generalized convex polyhedron and we will discuss the construction after the break right now i'm interested in getting back to reflection groups for a while and let me discuss reflection groups again we already i already mentioned that for discreteness, right? So uh, for discreteness, I need that the angle, the diagonal angle is, is nice, right? So uh, that, let me state it as a fact. So it is a theorem. If gamma and as on X, so here X is one of the three spaces of constant curvature, the Euclidean space ED, the sphere SD, or the hyperbolic space HD is a reflection group. So this is a discrete group generated by reflections and P is its chamber or its fundamental is its fundamental domain which is chosen as connected component right so this is connected component of x minus the union of h alpha right for all invariant hyperplanes of reflections in gamma, uh, then P is the so-called coxeter polyhedron. Coxeter, well, it is a generalized, but a, so it should be actually mentioned, right? It is a generalized. Oxeter polyhedron. That is, 
it is a polyhedron such that the dihedral angle between any two bounding hyperplanes that intersect has the form. So that is P is an intersection. Okay, so by K from one to maybe infinity or some number N, and h k minus such that the dihedral angle dihedral angle which i will denote as the angle between h i and hj is some pi, so with some number that looks like pi over mij, where mij belongs to the set two, three, where and so on plus infinity. Okay, uh, so this is generalized when we talk about polyhedron. Uh, well, this uh, actually, so let me use this board and I will leave a remark that in Euclidean spaces and on the spheres, we, well, in the Euclidean spaces, we can have intersecting hyperplanes and parallel hyperplanes, right? In the hyperbolic spaces, I remind you that we also have ultra parallel, ultra -parallel spaces, uh, hyperplanes that are divergent, right? So in this case, we just do not have any dihedral angles, right? Uh, so let me leave a remark. Uh, so actually I can write it here, right? Uh, such that the angle is this. Uh, if hi or hj intersect uh, in x or meet at infinity, right, on, on the boundary. On the boundary. And uh, this, in fact, follows from the following. So let me give some uh, proof. So if chamber, if we have a chamber P, and this is my bounding, these are my bounding hyperplanes, I will, we will think about two, right? H1 and H2. For any hyperplanes, H1, H2 bonding P, we have the intersection being a n my d minus two dimensional space, right? We have H1 intersect H2. Being a d minus two dimensional subspace or plane of X. Then the composition X is, is a rotation, right? Then R1 composition R2 
So this is H1, H2, and this is the intersection, right? Then it acts as a rotation. On the end, on an angle alpha, right? It is a rotation around intersection and with respect to the angle uh, to alpha. And the simple consideration is that if alpha, if alpha is not equal to y over some number m, where m is an integer greater than, greater or equal than 2, then some power, so basically, then you will find some hyperplane H that intersects then there exists a hyperplane or mirror, right? Hyperplane H with RH belonging to, uh, okay. It, it, it is going even to belong to the subgroup generated by reflections R1 and R2 which is the subgroup of gamma, right? Uh, such that H uh, intersects the interior of the cone, H1 intersects H2. So such that H intersects the interior of the cone, H1 minus intersects H2 minus. But this is a contradiction with the choice of the fundamental chamber P, right? This contradicts the choice of P. And this ends the proof. Okay, uh, so this is very important. If the if an angle if the diagonal angle here is not nice enough, by repeating the rotations by applying the rotations to uh, hyperplanes, you also obtain uh, reflections. Uh, in fact, I uh, actually I kind of used one part of the argument. Uh, which was not, which was implicitly here, but I didn't explicitly write it down. Uh, and I, I'm going to write it down. We used, well, we kind of used the fact that the conjugation of any, uh, well, of any reflection, we used that for every G belonging to ism X, the conjugation G of RH G inverse is actually equal to R G of H. So the conjugation of the, refle of the reflection with respect to hyperplane H uh, is actually a reflection, and it is a reflection with respect to the hyperplane, which is the image of H by G, right? So when you rotate, uh, so when you apply the rotation, right, it is an element of your group. So you will obtain, right, by applying the rotation, you apply the rotation to the hyperplane, you'll get a new hyperplane. And the reflection with this new hyperplane, right? 
it already it also sits in your group since it is obtained as a conjugation uh yeah basically just try to conjugate uh h uh, you can take g as a reflection with respect to h1 and conjugate this reflection in h2 by reflection with respect to h1 you will get a new reflection and so on so geometrically your hyperplanes are obtained as just rotations uh, by this element, right? And at some point, if an angle is not... So if, if the angle is like that, you will just come back to this picture and the cone is the Coxeter cone in some sense and uh, everything is okay. And you will just get a finite. So you will obtain... A tessellation of the space by finite amount of coxeter cones of, of basically of those uh, just you have two hyperplanes meeting at the t minus one dimensional subspace right and uh, if then if an angle is not like that right if it is something weird then you will get at some point well it is because of the Basically, it will be because of the irrationality of uh, the multiplier here, right? Okay, to be more precise, if it is 2 pi over m, uh, the rotations uh, can give you... So, uh, let me just show the picture. Generally, I can take something like this, right? An angle 2 pi over 3 here. But what happens if I apply this? So rotations with respect to pi, to pi over three give me good tessellation, right? But if I start acting by uh, reflections, then I will get, so let me reflect this here, right? This give me this gives me this domain. Uh, but this hyperplane, this reflection, it already intersects the Edison domain, right? So the reflection, the mirror, on this side, it intersects the Edison guy. And then uh, this reflection intersects my cone. So 2 pi over 3 is not good as well. But pi over 3 will be good, yeah? The group generated by the reflections with this, with respect to these two sides, is going to be discrete. Everything is nice, but the issue is that this cone is not going to be a fundamental cone for the group generated by two reflections. You see, uh, but if you take uh, the, so uh, it's like a remark, right? So it's not so the group generated by two reflections. R1 and R2. Is discrete. But this cone is not fundamental. So remark. He is not. Fundamental. For gamma. Although gamma is discrete. Right. But if it is in the case when this is 2 pi over 3, okay? Then an angle is 2 pi over 3. I can take those reflections, but the issue is that at some point I obtain a hyperplane that intersects, you see? So the reflection R3, it is also an element of gamma, right? It is an element of gamma. So if an, if the angle is even, so it can be even nice, relatively nice. It's not pi over three, but it's two pi over three, like rational multiple of p of pi. And then I apply the reflection, and I obtain a new reflection still sitting in my gamma, such that it intersects the uh, cone p. So this cone, right? This cone is not a fundamental domain for gamma. To get a fundamental domain, I need to cut it more. And the new, the red guy, 
here is going to be a fundamental domain. So red guy P prime is P prime is fundamental, which is a half of this. This will be within angle pi over three. Okay, uh, so let's make a five minutes break and then we will uh, discuss the modular group P cell to Z acting on the uh, hyperbolic plane. And then I will uh, tell you something about Poincaré method. And may, well, I'm not sure about Poincaré method, but at least I will mention it. But we will discuss the construction for arbitrary discrete group of isometries. Okay. Okay, so let us continue. I was going to discuss modular group, and just before that, I need an example of a reflection of an interesting reflection group. So an example, let us consider, let's consider a group generated by reflections in the sides of ideal regular ideal triangles a group uh, i don't know let's denote it by gamma generated by reflections in sides of the regular ideal triangle, ideal regular triangle in H2 in the hyperbolic plane. It is actually, there is a general question. So now assume that you have some coxeter polyhedron, and then you can take um, a group generated by reflections with respect to the sides of this polyhedron. Uh, will you get a complete tessellation of the space? And will this be, will then this fundamental polyhedron, will, will then this convex polyhedron, coxeter polyhedron, be a fundamental domain for your group? So there is a general theorem that the, the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, but we, this is basically the Poincaré method, but uh, in some, but generally without this theorem, it's a bit complicated actually to say. Uh, but in some cases, like here, in this in this example, you will be able to understand it even without some general complicated theorems. And let me suggest this example. So we take a bull model. H2, and then you consider a regular standard Euclidean triangle inscribed in the unit circle bounding the ball model, right? B2. And then you take a geodesic, hyperbolic geodesic triangle, right? So in this, in the upper half plane model, for instance, you can view it as such triangle or or as this triangle so there are different ways to select a triangle an ideal triangle in, in this model but we start with this canonical choice here since it simplifies our construction then you take so this is an ideal triangle t right then you take an inversion so we should subdivide uh, basically, you take you, you take all the way the midpoints of all arcs that are not included in your triangle yet, and then you join. Obviously, uh, this triangles here, T1, T2, and T3. So... 
Uh, okay. Uh, one can see, right, that T1, T2, and T3 are obtained as reflective images of T, right? As reflective images or, or actually reflection images, reflection images of T just with respect to, by reflection to in the size of T. And then you can continue this process and uh, basically by induction, one can show that uh, by induction, right, you can basically do this induction by the number of, I don't know, by the number of vertices in this sub tessellation, right? You can show that at some point you will uh, cover the entire space, right? By induction, we can prove that uh, gamma t, which is the union by all gamma of gamma t, is a tessellation, tessellates Tessellates the entire space H2, right? You just do it like that. You say you pick a point, and then you just need to show that it belongs to some triangle, right? So obviously, you just need to find ch like a chain of triangles starting from here and covering this point. Uh, it is relatively obvious that you can do it, but, well, maybe it requires some technical details, but you just show that it cannot happen. To the, you basically show that every point here, right, you just take the uh, midpoint and it's up, you keep, like keep dividing. Uh, and you will reach uh, so how you can do it. Uh, I think that you can do it by choosing a regular uh, Euclidean polygon first, uh, covering your point, and then you probably take a large. So basically, you just do it by choosing a large enough number of vertices here, right? So, uh, and this means that, so this implies, right, this implies that uh, gamma is a reflection group, is a, is a reflection group with a fundamental domain, the fundamental polygon or a triangle with a fundamental triangle T. Okay. There is an interesting consequence of this. Uh, this works for every subdivision of T uh, in triangles, right? As a corollary, so this is an example number one. In example number two, one can take a subdivision in six triangles and take this triangle with angles zero. So for T being a triangle with angles 5 over 2, 5 over 
three and zero, right? Which is basically pi over infinity. Sometimes it is also denoted as just two, three infinity triangle, right? It's reflection group. group I, I will denote it as uh, I don't know ref raffle of uh, okay let it be t prime raffle of t prime uh, it is going to be so this group is a larger group right it contains some reflections that do not sit in ref of t uh, so raffle of t prime uh, is well, it also has uh, is a discrete group with fundamental triangle T prime such that the index of reflection group with respect to T in this larger group is finite and it is equal to six, right? The index is equal to six. So for any regular, in, in fact, for regular polygons, it is indeed kind of more, it is indeed simpler to show that you can always find this uh, yeah, by the way, uh, this triangle uh, is the, an angle with all angles being equal to zero, right? This is pi over infinity. So this is indeed an Coxeter triangle, right? I didn't know, I didn't like write it down here, but this triangle is a Coxeter. It's obviously Coxeter. It's just omitted here because angles are zero it's not interesting but here i actually should write it down uh, so it's a coxeter triangle coxeter triangle with one ideal vertex and two standard finite ones right coxeter triangles Coxeter triangle with one ideal vertex. This is here. Okay, so the reflection group with respect to this red triangle also acts nicely and uh, in fact it gives a tessellation obviously of the plane, right? Since you get the tessellation first by ideal uh, triangles but then every ideal can be subdivided again into six just by reflections, okay? So even for subdivisions, it is now we can show that it works. Okay, uh, again, in general, this is a complicated theorem to show that if you have a coxeter polyhedron, then the group generated by reflections acts uh on the plane and this it's a discrete group acting on the plane and uh the fundamental the coxeter polyhedron is its fundamental polyhedron okay now uh i want to consider an example of uh yeah by the way uh let's just draw this picture let's look at uh this picture in the model u2 then you get something like that right this is minus one zero one Okay, so I'm trying to
Mm -hmm. Okay, so I should divide it first in half, right? I'm not sure, something like that. No, uh, I'm not sure if I'm happy with this picture. Let me use the the triangle here. Okay, so I'm choosing those. One my infinite point is here. Okay. Yeah, I want to obtain a tessellation by okay, so ideal triangle is just any of this, right? While the choice for this triangle, I guess, can be different but this is my t prime from here right so the angles are pi over two pi over three and zero and this is these are my angles this is t prime in this hyperboloid model the angle here at this vertex is pi over three okay this is my angle pi over three I hope it's visible. So uh, this is my uh, reflection group, T prime, just from this model, OK? And uh, this will play an important role in the following. Now, an example of the modular group. PSL to Z. So recall that the full isometry group of H2 can be identified with PSL to R and uh, it's semi-direct product with a group of order two generated by reflection R1, where R1 of Z is just minus Z bar, right? It is a reflection with respect to this vertical half line, right? Z minus Z bar. OK. Uh, I zoom, so in fact, this group consists of so PSL to R Here, ESL to R is the group of orientation preserving isometries. Consists of of isometries Z to A Z plus B over C Z plus D. Where A, B, C, D are real numbers, and A, D minus B, C is equal to plus one, right? Uh, and uh, we also have an irritation reversing isometries, right? 
and all orientation reversing isometries. Reversing isometries are described as follows. As follows. These look like Z acting to A Z bar plus B over C Z bar plus D. So here we have this conjugated guy. And the idea is that you first apply the reflection and then the standard Mobius transform, which is orientation preserving, right? One can show that. Well, obviously this is enough, since any orientation reversing isometry, once you apply a reflection, which is the bar, you will get an orientation preserving isometry, right? So uh, the point is that since it is minus the bar, we need to, you know, we need to write that where a D minus B C is equal to minus one. Like check for the reflection minus Z bar. You will see that the determinant of the matrix is actually equal to minus one, right? Okay. The modular group is the group PSL to Z. A modular group is PSL to Z, right? Which consists of of all transformations Z to A Z plus B over C Z plus D with A B C D integers. And AD minus BC is equal to 1, right? So this is my modular group. Uh, I can also extend it with the conjugation, right? The One can consider the extended modular group. The extended... modular group PSL to Z tilde which also includes all integer orientation reversing integer transforms right which also includes all orientation reversing integer transforms, integer maps, isometries. This group contains the following reflections. contains flexions of 
R1 of Z, obviously, right? R1, these are one already mentioned here, which maps Z to minus Z bar. And also it has R2 of Z, which is one minus Z bar. And uh, it has R3, which sends Z to minus one over, oh, uh, wait a second, Y minus one over Z bar or one over Z bar. I forgot, uh, one over Z, I guess it, it changes. Right? Yes. Yeah, one well, minus one over Z. Yeah, it should be plus, I guess. Yeah. I think it should be plus, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, it is it is equal to it is just inversion. Right? The Z over the norm of Z squared, right? Okay. Uh so the picture these isometries are precisely these reflections in this picture, in this red triangle. So let me draw the picture. So this is R1. Here the angle is pi over 3. This is my reflection R2, and this is my reflection R3. So the claim is that this group is actually generated by reflections with respect to this triangle T prime over here. Okay, uh, now I am going to use the left board over here. In fact, PSL to the tilde is isomorphic to the reflection group with respect to T prime. This is my triangle T prime here. It is a triangle, it is this triangle from this previous example. Okay. Uh, well, I would say that uh, it follows from uh, the following fact that any matrix, so uh, indeed, the composition of R1 and of R2 and R1 is just the translation, right? So indeed, R, first I'm applying R1 and then R2. Uh, is, okay, what is it? It should be Z to Z plus one, right? Is it correct? Yes, I first change Yes. So it corresponds to the matrix one, one, zero, one, right? And uh, there is another matrix that I can obtain, say, R3 and R1, right? The composition of R3 and R1. It is going to be 1 over Z, right?
And this is the matrix 0, 1, Ah, minus one over z, right? Yes. So it should be this. Okay. Uh, obviously, let me denote this matrix by A and this by B. Any matrix, any matrix from SL to Z can be represented as a word of letters A, B, a inverse b inverse right this shows that and this implies that this claim basically this implies that the reflection group this implies that so hence esl to z tilde is generated by is generated by R one R two R three and moreover the fundamental domain for I will use this piece of the board to finish to conclude this example. Uh, moreover, the fundamental domain for fundamental domain for PSL to Z itself is on this picture. I need to take this triangle T and reflect it to the left. So this gives me T prime and R of R1 of T prime. And this all orange triangle with angles pi over three, pi over three, zero. is the fundamental triangle for PSL to Z, right? It is, it simply follows from the fact that PSL to Z, right? PSL to Z tilde is a super group of index two of PSL to Z. So it is also a semi-direct product of PSL to Z and with the cyclic group of order two generated by the reflection R1, right? It follows just from, uh, again, from these obvious considerations with orientation preserving and reversing isometries. So after I know that it is in index two, I know that by after I reflect this here, I indeed obtain the fundamental domain. Why? Since by acting so, yeah, I have two domains here. I obtain the tessellation by the reflection group, right? But if I forget about this reflection, this is indeed my group PSL to Z, right? By adding this reflection, basically adding this reflection R1, it cuts the fundamental domain. It divides it into two domains, RT prime and RT, R1 T prime for my reflection group. P cell to Z, yeah? So the idea is that when you, uh, so the fundamental domain of a bigger group is smaller. So if you want to get a fundamental domain of a, a smaller subgroup, you need to glue several copies of your fundamental domain. The only question is how, but uh, this gluing 
it sh this gluing it should correspond to the kind of the symmetry of the ambient group, right? And this this is what happens here. Okay, this is about uh, PSL to Z. Now uh, there is a general question. So what to do in in a general case? And the general uh, case, in fact, can be done as follows. Let me write down at least the construction and yeah, and how okay, uh, let me use the board. Okay, let me use this board, I guess. And this construction is called the Dirichlet domain. Okay, so this Dirichlet domain is so let gamma be a discrete. subgroup of Aizom X. Suppose that P is a point in X such that the stabilizer of P is trivial. Right. Then, okay, uh, let me, yeah, okay, unfortunately, I think I will not have enough time to, okay, yeah, I think I will not have enough time. So, uh, Okay, uh, I will just describe the construction and formulate the main theorem, and then I will prove it next time. So let gamma be a discrete subgroup of Isom X. Uh, I choose a point P, such that the stabilizer is trivial. This means that I have no isometries fixing my P. Uh, then for every, uh, for every, so let me, choose this point P here, then for every isometry gamma and gamma set, this is the notation H sub gamma of P, be the following half space. It is the set of all points X and X such that the distance between x and p is less than or equal so such that the distance between x and p is less than or equal than the distance between x and gamma p right So the geometrically it looks like that. I have uh, P and I have for every gamma, I have its image, right? It is not the P itself, so it's some other point. Then I am taking the geodesic segment joining P and 
MIP and I need to take the bisector of this segment. And this is my the hyperplane dividing the segment in the midpoint, right? And H gamma P is this half space. Right? Okay. Now we say that the so by definition the Dirichlet domain centered at P. So the the domain is denoted as D of A, sorry, D of P, right? G of P. It is the intersection by all gamma and gamma of the half spaces H gamma of P. And this is my You already see from the definition that it looks like something bounded by hyperplanes, right? Uh, the only question is why it is a generalized convex polyhedron. And this is actually the theory. I'm not sure I, I will go into, okay, I will just use this word here. So the theorem, the, there is a theorem. Theorem. So, um, gamma in X is discrete, gamma P is trivial, is a trivial stabilizer, then the Dirichlet domain, the Dirichlet domain D of P is a generalized convex polyhedron is a generalized convex polyhedron being a fundamental domain of gamma. Uh, and uh, okay, so this is uh, well, this is a very important statement. So this implies that you can always achieve uh, that a fundamental domain can be so it can be chosen to be a, con a generalized convex polyhedron, uh, and uh, definitely it coincides. Uh, so for reflection groups, uh, the construction is very rigid. You have like no choice up to isometry the fundamental domain is unique. Generally, you can have really many uh, different fundamental domains. We saw examples for, Euclid, for the Euclidean plane, right? Uh, probably I will mention the proof of this statement of this theorem next time, but maybe I will give some hint or a sketch. I'm not sure. Uh, we, in fact, need to move already closer to the uh, like most important theorems of our course, but uh, just an, as an example, if gamma is ESL to Z, right, then uh, this fundamental domain I, I was drawing here, right, with angles pi over 3, Uh, actually, it can be, so uh, the point is that there is some 
point on this vertical half line that so there is some so let it be let me denote this triangle by I don't know uh delta right there exist there exists some lambda i such that delta is d of lambda i for this choice of fundamental domain. It is an exercise. You can try to find this lambda. I don't really remember. Maybe 2i or something like that. I'm not sure. I forgot unfortunately uh, but just let's try to, yeah let's try to play with it okay so um the plan for the next lecture so like the next lecture well, i will address another question uh first of all given gamma and suppose you already found the uh fundamental domain can we write uh gamma as something generated by so if it is a finite-sided fundamental domain can you generate gamma by finitely many reflections in this case the extended psl to z is generated by three elements in fact if we work a bit harder with this generating elements uh, we can find the defining relations for them so some of the relations so they will have some words uh, that are actually trivial in this group so the main question is how to find such a group theoretic presentation of our discrete groups this will be the next important question another important question is uh, kind of the reverse assume that you have some fundamental domain and uh, that you know how exactly it can be so you know the isometries that send your fundamental polyhedron that okay that your potential fundamental polyhedron to the adjacent chambers so the question is can the group generated by this uh is, is this group generated by this like uh, okay transformations uh, is it discrete and is your polyhedron indeed fundamental for this group and uh, yes yeah, so there is indeed the method that allows to go both ways right to go both ways this is very important yeah, and we will see applications in the case of psl2z as well for reflection groups and probably for some other groups uh then yeah then we will pass to like general theory of discrete service of league groups that's the plan for the next lectures. Okay, thanks very much for your attention and see you next uh, week.